All right, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, the Poet Summit here in Cologne, Germany. I'm Paul Kufalos from White Star Software. Today we're going to finish off the first day with uh, reliability and robustness of the Open Edge database. So before I get started, this presentation is not free. I would like you all to participate. The people in the chat who are a few seconds behind us, the people in the room, if you have questions, please raise your hand, ask questions. That way, if I go long at the end, I can blame Simon in the room who's going to ask questions. Um, uh, but please do participate. It's more fun for us, too, if you participate. So who am I? Um, I've been doing this since 1994. I'm not a programmer. Uh, my programming credentials were taken away many, many, many years ago. I'm not allowed to program. I'm strictly a technical architect, uh, sysadmin, DBA, uh, basically anything that isn't uh, programming. Uh, and I've been doing this, like I said, for a long time. And, and the cool part is really that we have a very wide range of customers. So our smallest customer is 10 users. Our largest customer is over 10,000 users. So we kind of get to see a little bit of everything and that's a, it's a lot of fun. We just get to see cool stuff. And I have twin boys who are growing faster than I want them to be growing. So first, before I start, the people in the chat, the people in the room, tell me quickly, what would it take to cause a problem in your open edge environment, all right? So A, who's an A here? Who, any little tiny thing would cause an open, a problem in their open edge environment? Okay, nobody in the room. B, oh, we got one little sheepish B. Oh, the other people are confident C. Who's C? Who would need like an act of God to perturb their open edge environment? Okay, who needs an alien invasion before their open edge environment? Oh, that's Adam in the back. <laughs> a lot of people didn't even raise their hands. Are we getting, there are a few seconds behind us. A lot of Bs. Any Cs? No Ds? I, I, I thought there would be a few C's and D's here, you know. I get the people, we talk to customers who think that they have these absolutely infallible environments and that anything could happen and they're ready. They've got Batman and, 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 uh, and Spider-Man ready to save the day. But in reality, it's just two old guys trying to get over the wall. So, so I'm glad in the chat at least nobody said C or D. I'm impressed too. I thought there would at least be a one C in there. So. All right, so what do we want to do? We, there's really three things we want to do to build a robust, a reliable open edge environment. We, first, we need to build a very solid base. From there, when we build our solid base, base let's configure it properly. And then you're not, you're not done afterwards. You need to take care of your environment. And a lot of people fail kind of at step three. And, and when we get there in two or three hours, I'll explain what I mean to you. So, um, yeah, so a lot of people, they, 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 they build it, they configure it, and then they never touch it for 11 years afterwards until it crashes and they realize, oh, I thought I was okay. So what are we going to do? We're going to start with a solid, solid, solid base, a solid foundation. For the database, yes, but also for everything else around the database. That's really, really, really important. So let's talk about the physical database first. Here we go. So, who is using here uh, fixed length data extents? One here, a couple here, and you have a variable overflow. Who's using, I don't know, uh, variable length data extents? A little mix of everything here too, great. And does anybody have a database where they have single storage areas in the multi-hundred gig range? or databases that are many hundreds of gigabytes? Sorry? 500 gigabytes in one extent. So yeah. you'll hear us, I mean, we, we generally say put everything in variable length extents. We don't bother with fixed length extents anymore, but we say it's for really 99, and I could even say 99.9% .9 of you don't need anything other than all variable length extents all the time, all right? There are some situations uh, like very, very large extents where you might want to have 
uh, fixed length extents. And, and the reasons are outside of the database, really. If you need to do DBRPR or if you need to physically copy the database, you're, uh, you're better off with, I want to say smaller files, but maybe not terabyte files. And, and really one terabyte is the limit for, for a progress database. So if you have any customers for an extent, did I say area? Oh, sorry, for an extent is what I meant, thank you. So it's the limit. <laughs> oh my God, we've got at least 10 customers who have gone over the limit. Uh, yeah, so it's the limit for one single file, one extent in the database. So is indirection kind of gone in modern disk systems? So the question is, is indirection gone in modern uh, disk systems? It must be, or it's so far into the humongous files that that triple inode indirection happens at a gajillion, gajillion somethings. I don't yeah, know. It, they so basically made the inode tables large enough that it's just not a matter Yeah, so, so Tom, Tom answered that all went away with journal file systems is really interesting. But we don't account for it at all. And I haven't seen anybody show me that there's a performance problem related to having 100 gig extents or 500 gig extents. I've never seen a performance problem related to that. All right. So what about AI and BI extents? That's the other question that I always get. And it's kind of the same answer. For 99% of you, all variable length AI and BI extents are, are more than good enough. And the point I really want to make here is you need to weigh the performance cost of using variable length extents versus the maintenance effort, the maintenance cost of having to manage and monitor these fixed length extents. And I would say that for, again, 99% of you, the, the performance cost is not, it's measurable, but it's not measurable to your business. So, so you as a DBA could measure it as 12% or 15% or 21% or something like that, but the business would never be able to measure an effect on the business, which is why I say just use variable length extents everywhere. Now, if you, in your particular situation, whether it's a combination of your hardware or how much changes you do in the database or whatever, and there's really a need for fixed length BI or AI extents, that's great, uh, as long as you can prove that. The performance cost, again, we do the math all the time with our customers. There is a performance cost, but it's in milliseconds often, and so there's really no cost at all to the, to the business. But there is a real cost to you, because if you're using fixed length extents and you screw up and you blow through your fixed length extents, then you could crash the database, freeze the database. You can do a number of things that will be much more uh, problematic to the business than, than losing this much performance uh, by having fixed length extents. So I encourage you to use uh, variable length extents everywhere. And, and sometimes, I see people do fixed and variable on AI, that just doesn't make any sense. So if you have fixed, 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 variable on after imaging extents, that just doesn't make sense. You either do one or the other. Simon? Manage your uh, file size, uh, your uh, uh, disk sizes. Then yeah. if everything's very... So the question is how do you manage your no, disk? Ah, uh, yeah, so he's saying manage your disk sizes, your disk usage, if you're using variable, I, and yes, it's always your, you have to watch out so you don't fill your disk arrays, uh, your, your file systems, but you kind of generally have to monitor all of that stuff anyways, whether you're using fixed or variable length extents, at some point, you're, you could potentially have a problem with disk usage, for sure. All right, so again, I, in the chat, if the people would answer in the chat, do you use all fixed, all variable, kind of fixed data and variable AI and BI or something else. Is there anybody else here doing something else? We kind of asked the question before. What are you doing, Simon? I just uh, discovered that you can make the BI first extent larger than 2 gig and automatically invokes the large uh, file size. Ah, so that's a good point from Simon. He said if you create a fixed BI extent, the first one, the first one greater than 2 gigs, that'll automatically enable large files for your databases. And I, th I think I wrote that here, right? Yeah, so this, this uh, here, this concept of one fixed BI extent of two gigs and one variable, that's, that's highly acceptable too. A lot of people do that because you're gonna grow your BI to a certain size anyways, you might as well just have it two gigs. 
Right, did I get anything from the chat? In OE12, do all databases have large files enabled? If you're enterprise database, yeah. So there are still here work groups. And, and most of what I'm talking about today is, is enterprise database. There are a couple of points here where I'll say watch out if you're on, on work group. So we do, especially with partners, um, partners will come to these conferences or, or come to our, our sessions and they have 100 customers who are all work group, 30, 40 users. And so we don't want them accidentally going out and doing some of these changes that maybe don't apply to their environment. All right. So let's move on to database configuration. All right. So what do we want? 4K, well, large files, I said yes for enterprise. Do we want 4K or 8K block size? We, we generally do 8K everywhere now. There, there was a time, a long time, where we were doing 4K on Linux and we were doing... 4K on Windows, and then 8K on the other Unix flavors. Uh, but generally, we just do 8K now uh, everywhere. Um, so is, is anybody running still 1K databases? Four, uh, is, are you guys doing 4K on Windows? You, see, yeah, four, see it's still 4K on Linux. It's not bad. I've never benchmarked it myself to tell you that 8K is absolutely much faster. Uh, but we just generally do 8K. There's, there's this microscopic risk of what they call torn pages. So because the operating system is reading and writing in 4K blocks and you have a, an 8K database blocks, it is possible that a hiccup might occur. And honestly, in 27 years, I think I've seen this once um, where half the block was written to disk because of an operating system issue and the database ended up being corrupt. So, so I wouldn't complain. Uh, AI and BI block size, just set it to 16K. Just, just set it and forget it. There's really no argument. And, and this will be the first, but maybe not the last time I say this. There are a lot of knowledge base entries that are no longer applicable. So you might find an old knowledge base entry that says that the AI block size is supposed to be half the BI block size or the other way around. I forget which one it is. There you go. So the, yes, the other way, but it doesn't matter. It's garbage. Just set them both to 16 and you'll be done with it. All right. Well, what does it mean not applicable? Is it the dependent on version? What's that? Did the block size BI and AI block size, is it dependent on version? No. Just set it to 16K. The hardware, everything changed not the last 10, 15 years. It's 16K. I mean, it's Okay. Even 20 years ago, 16K was nothing. I mean, just set it to 16, 16K is when the writer, when basically when you write 16K worth of changes to the database, one of the processes or the BI writer will say, oh, that's full, and let me write it to disk. So rather than going 8K, write, 8K, write, 8K, write, you're going 16K, write, 16K, write. And I would set it higher, but it doesn't exist higher. So, so 16K is the biggest number, and that's what... We, we say to use. Now the BI cluster size, that's a little bit, m there's a little bit more singing and dancing and waving your hands around when it comes to the BI cluster size. Again, I would say for most of you, eight megs or 16 megs is more than good enough. And on quieter systems, you could probably set it lower. I don't really see a, a disadvantage though to setting it to eight megabytes or 16 megabytes. So go ahead. Set it to 8 or 16, and watch your, and there's a number of metrics you need to watch. So you, of course you need to watch for checkpoint length. And, and this is another place where I think the, the, you have to watch out in the documentation. There's documentation out there, and there's old knowledge base entries, and there's old stuff that say, make sure your checkpoint length is at least one minute. That was probably true when disks turned at you know, four RPMs, you know, when it was a little hamster turning the wheel and you wanted that one minute checkpoint length. So you had lots of time to finish writing buffers to disk. With today's hardware, I would say as, as long as you're not hitting sustained checkpoint lengths in the single digit seconds, I'm not highly stressed about that, right? So 15, 30 seconds, that's fine. Longer checkpoint lengths don't matter. It's really, you don't want to start coming into the one and two second uh, checkpoint lengths. And, and if you're running a modern version of OpenEdge, when you go into that checkpoint screen in Protop or Promon, 
There's a lot of information there about where you're spending your time during that checkpoint. So really, really important. If you're having checkpoint issues or if you suspect you're freezing because of checkpoint issues, go and check. Is it because of uh, your disks are slow? Is it because your, ch your BI cluster size is too small? Uh, you go and check all of these things. So, but again, most of you, you should be fine on eight uh, megabytes. And if your work group, leave it to 512K because there's none of the helper processes like the BI writer and the AI writer that are available to you or the asynchronous page writer. All right, so let's move on to type two storage area. So I, I hope all of you know what a type two storage area is. The main thing you need to remember is that in a type two storage area, when you're looking at a data block on disk, it only contains data from one database object. So there's no mixing and matching orders and order lines and customer records within the same block. That's the primary thing that you need to know about type two storage areas. And really there's a couple of settings for a type two storage area. One is the records per block and the other is the blocks per cluster. All right. And, and I won't dive into it uh, too much in here. There's lots and lots of talks. I've done lots and lots of talks about, about type two storage areas. What I do want to say is, generally speaking, we don't want to mix objects in type two storage areas. Don't mix, so put indexes in areas only with other indexes. Put tables in areas with tables and put lobs in areas with lobs. And there are some really good reasons to do that. For example, if you need to do an index rebuild, there's a really good reason to segregate your table data from your index data because the, the index rebuild utility needs to open the index area in read write, but if you want to do multi-threaded reads of the table area, then it has to open it up in read only. Uh, and if you've got indexes and tables mixed, then the, the index rebuild utility won't be able to open up that uh, table area multi-threaded. And so you'll be left with one data scan thread for that initial scan period, right? If you're, if you're, if you're opening up indexes or modifying indexes in that same area. Is so it, is, it, uh, too? is it the same for C lobs too? Uh, not for index rebuild because there, there's nothing to rebuild. There's, there's no, there's no index for a, a lob or a clob per se. Uh, but again, generally for things like DBRPR also, if we're scanning the database, we want tables and tables, index and index and lob and lob, generally speaking. Yeah? Yeah, well, you can do that first. Okay. okay. Um, there's an old, uh, old knowledge-based entry out there that says use one for records for blocks for index areas. And that existed because there were some limitations way, way back about uh, only two billion row IDs per storage area. And so by setting it to a higher number, you were limiting the physical size of your storage area, even for an index area. That limitation has been gone for, I don't know how long, more than a decade, I would say at least, if not, not quite two decades. So you don't need that anymore. So what's the downside to putting one record per block? Well, the downside is all the developers in this room. That's what the downside is. <laughs> So the bloody developer drops a, a table into a storage area with one record per block, and guess what? Every 100 bytes record takes up eight kilobytes, you know? And then he inserts a million records, and they're wondering why they have an eight gigabyte storage area uh, for, for adding, you know, a few thousand or whatever records into the database. So don't do that. Just don't set it to one. There's no value to that. Set it to 64, set it to 128, it's ignored, right? That the value of, in, of records per block does not apply to an index. It's ignored, but at least it protects you from that problem. And again, it's, the whole point here is having this rel reliable and robust environment here, really. Okay? And how do you segregate your tables? There really isn't one set way to do it. There are some best practices, but I, I want to say that once you move your database to a type two storage area, you've already done like 80% of the good work. And then the rest is kind of like better, you know? So what I usually do, take the, the three or four biggest tables and the most active tables, 
segregate them into their own storage area, take all the tables that have zero records or almost zero records, put them in a garbage area, miscellaneous area, whatever you want to call it, and then all the other ones, you know, do what you want to do with them. Uh, the only thing I'll say is don't, don't segregate your data by some application module, right? Don't go and say, let me put the, you know, the, the order stuff here and the manufacturing stuff here and the inventory stuff here. That makes absolutely no sense. A database is a physical object. You're, do, you're doing a physical activity here. You're not doing logical separation of data. So use some physical characteristic to segregate your data. So typically average record size is the one we would say that you would use for segregating your data. So the biggest ones alone, the smallest ones all together in the miscellaneous, and then do what you want in the middle, but segregate them by some technical value like average record size. Good? Yeah. What record per block setting would you recommend on logs? So what record per block setting would you would I set on logs? I, I don't think it really matters all that much either. Sorry. And there's, there's one score factor instead of one. Yeah. Yeah, but you get a double jump Yeah, it's not going to be a full block, so you want to have enough to you know, not waste it. Yeah. 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 yeah, so the question is what records per block setting do you put for a lob space? And I think the general consensus from the audience is a lob is generally going to be bigger than 8K, so you could set it to one. But Tom was saying that you always have that last little fragment. So, you know, if the last little fragment is 1K in an 8K block, you're going to waste the rest of that block. So you might want to set it to 8 or 16. I could say that if you set it to 64 or 128, the block header is going to be bigger and you might lose a dozen bytes or whatever, some number of bytes at the beginning because the block header is bigger. Uh, but generally, I don't think it's going to make uh, much of a difference. I don't like putting one record per block for anything, so that one is out. And I would probably do 16, 32, 64 uh, if I was doing a lob area. There was a record per block calculation that were mentioned in chapter number one that we saved that one earlier. Can Say that again? There was a when you said record per block to one. Uh, probably didn't do a record per block calculation. That was a like the earlier reason for not overusing one on index area earlier. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, I'll try again. Uh, in the earlier days, at least, uh, they had, they were, it was meant that there was a record per block calculation. Yeah. That you saved doing when you had the index areas in the record per block one, uh, one setting. Right. Which is probably not, or gone these days. We have a lot of CPUs also. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm not aware. I, no, I don't think so. No, they used to say one, again, because of the size of the storage area and the 2,000 rows per storage, a uh, 2 billion rows per storage area limit. But since then, whatever, you, you know, how many, I'm what's the... index area, it's not going to matter anyway because there's not going to be any rows. There's a lot. Exactly. There's a lot anyway because they're all in the index block. Exactly. So, well, now, did I forget anything here? No, I'm good. We're all good. All right, so, yeah. so, you know, we always focus on the database, but you have to build your solid database on a solid foundation, right? So if you're sitting on an old computer in your closet, and I have seen this at customers, where is the server? And they open a closet, and <laughs> you know, and that's where the server is. Like, if that's your foundation, that's going to be a problem. If you're still running 10.2a03, 23, which is a customer we have right now running 10.2a0323, that's a problem. You know, you're, you're getting further and further away from supported environments and you have to jump through more and more hoops to provide a reliable environment to the business, right? If you're still running Windows XP or Windows Server 2003 or even 2008, like that's a problem. You can't virtualize. There's no drivers, or you can virtualize, but there's a lot of kind of these um, these simulated drivers. What do they call them? Compatibility drivers that go in there, and so you're 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 making your environment shakier uh, and less reliable by forcing yourself to maintain these older uh, these older systems. So, uh, you know, who's on HPUX? Anybody in the chat on HPUX? 
Anybody here on HPUX or, or customers on HPUX? Like that's a dead platform, right? Anybody on CentOS? I'm sure there's people on CentOS in the chat. We have customers on CentOS who are like, oh, they just, end of life is December 31st, 2021. It's in six weeks, end of life for CentOS. So, you know, they just said like, you know what? Too bad. Go get Red Hat or go get Ubuntu, do what you want. CentOS is, we're done with CentOS. So you, you can't be there anymore. Uh, you, you have to watch out for that in your systems. That's adding risk to your environment. And Numa has become a big thing. Adam has done a lot of talks on Numa especially. So I encourage you to, to listen to Adam's talks or to ask him questions. If you don't know what Numa is, you should find out because there's a very good chance that the next server you're going to purchase for your data center is going to be a Numa box. It's almost certainly going to be a Numa box. And there is some very significant performance issues related to that. So you need to know about them. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of very unhappy people because you're going to have variable performance. Sometimes it's going to be good and sometimes it's not going to be good and nobody's going to understand why. It's going to be because you're on a Numa box. All right. It becomes more variable as you get busier. And it becomes more variable as you get busier, Adam says. Oh, yeah. We have a couple of chat comments between the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, Ruyan is uh, suggesting regarding the log question uh, that you use the value between 2 and 8 and set the create limit to 32 and that will keep you from uh, giving too much trouble. I don't know coming through in the, uh, on the mic. Well, they're going to get it like in, in about 45 seconds. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Ruan said to set the records per block to, what did you say, 2 to somewhere between two and eight, but then change the, the, the create lip, no, the toss limit to 32, create. the create limit to 32. Uh, and then uh, we have a comment that uh, if you do have, uh, you could have things in the streams area, and the most common thing that people are trying not to is that they get default indexes because mm -hmm. developers, for some reason, create tables. <laughs> so the other comment from the chat is, you know, we say don't put anything in the schema area from the earlier slide, but if you're a developer, again, causing trouble again, creating a table without an index again, then progress will automatically create the default index and it'll create it in the schema area. So, Who's wrong? Who's wrong? The developer is wrong. Of course the developer is wrong. No, you have to have unindexed. The developer, I, you can even say the, the, you know, the database architect, whoever created that table, who created a table without an index on it? I mean, we have an alert for that, we have an alert for that in Proton. <laughs> we also have an alert for all the default indexes in the schema area. <laughs> all right, let's keep going here. Now, let's configure it properly. How am I doing on time? Not too bad. All right. Actually, not good, actually. I'm, but yeah, okay, let me go faster. So let's configure it properly now. We got a great database, let's configure it properly. And you have a lot of tools at your disposal to, to, to do this. And, and one thing that always you know, blows me away is you have all of these tools and you don't use them probably because A, you're busy and B, you might not be aware. So I'm trying to put some all of these quickly for you into one slide deck so that you can, uh, so that you can have them all in one place, all right? Now, I'm not gonna try to figure out which parameters are available in which version. If you try this and it doesn't work, it's not available in your version, all right? That's how it works. And please do all this stuff in test first. Don't just jump into production, please. Please, production, we don't test in production. It's, I don't understand, that's it. Don't test in production. So, DB check and mem check, just turn them on, okay? Just turn them on. You know, when they first came out, there was questions. Is there a cost? Is there an effect? No, as far as I know. I mean, I haven't seen anything there. And maybe someone in the chat will have a story about, you know, there might be a reason not to enable these, but I'm, I'm not aware of a reason not to enable these things. Set all your base table, table range size, index range size, and all the, set all of those properly so that you're gathering statistics for all your tables and all of your indexes. And there's, there's a help page there for ProTop. You can just go into ProTop screen, it's free. You hit that, that key and it tells you here, set them. These are the values you need to set. 
So invest five minutes and Protop will tell you your optimal values for, for setting all of these range sizes. All right? The one gotcha you have to watch out for here, if you're using Open Edge Explorer, Open Edge Explorer does not like negative values for base table and base index. And so you need to put those in the other startup parameters. All right? So don't be surprised if, if, uh, if uh, Open Edge Explorer doesn't allow it. Yes? What, what do DB check and mem check too? They check the DB and they check the memory. <laughs> uh, they, they do like CRC checks. They do various um, integrity checks, both in blocks that are going to the database. Uh, th there's table check also. There's index check and DB check is both of those. But it, they do integrity tests of the block that's going to be written to disk to make sure that the block they're about to write to disk actually makes sense from a whole point of view. And I think they do CRC checks essentially on the block. And memcheck, I actually don't remember exactly what, do you remember what memcheck does? It's the other way around. I think that's on the read. Memcheck is the other way around on the read. Okay. That's what Tom is saying. So, so the comment here is really keeps you from having corruption or at, at, the, at the very least reporting the corruption when it occurs saying, hey, you read this or you wrote this and it didn't end up the way you thought it was going to end up. Um, spin. So you have to watch out for this. So I was just looking at spin quickly trying to find out what the values are. So the default value for spin, in, at least in 11.7, uh, is 6,000 times the number of CPUs in your box. The documentation says that the optimal value is 20,000 times the number of CPUs. And today, modern systems, they all have eight cores, 16 cores, I don't know, they all have a relatively large number of cores, and it's highly unlikely that you need a minus spin of 150,000. Now, you might be one of those kind of edge cases where that's valuable. I would say that any value in that 10, 20,000 range is probably good for most of you. And then there's some specific things you need to monitor for that'll tell you that you need to increase these values, but generally speaking, 10 to 20, I think you guys are all fine on, on modern CPUs, right? If you're still running a 20-year-old box, this does not apply to you, all right? And AI buffs, BI buffs, same thing, kind of like the AI, the block size and the BI block size, around 100 to 200 is fine. And it's 16K, so 200 times 16K is no memory at all. So just set it to 100 or 200, and chances are you're, you're fine, all right? Another question. Yeah. So the question is, Adam's talk earlier today was there's no reason to have more than eight cores in, in almost every environment. And on top of that, if you're buying hardware, always buy the fastest CPUs you can afford. Don't listen to the sales guy who's trying to sell you 800 million slower CPUs. That's not what you need. You want stuff to go fast. That's how, that's how da databases work. So given that, do we still want the 20,000 or a 10,000 or whatever? And the answer is no, 10 to 20,000 is gonna be fine unless there's some data that says you should have a faster number. Tom. Uh, we'll talk about this at the end of the day tomorrow. Tom has an entire talk about this at the end of the, what's it called? Concurrency. Concurrency. So please come to the concurrency talk where he'll dive into this. Yeah, in detail, because I am running out of time as usual. <laughs> All right, lock table. Listen, there is no way I can tell you what a good value is for lock table. Or, you know, if you if you set it too small, you might start getting lock table overflows. If you get too many lock table overflows, like in, who was here in in uh, Patrice's talk earlier, right? If you get enough lock table overflows, you're going to blow your minus MXS excess shared memory and your database is going to crash. So you don't want it too low. But if I go to a customer and the minus L is set to 20 million, I'm suspicious that there's some code that could be optimized, right? So we see 100, 200, 300,000 pretty often. That seems to be something we see a lot. So when I start seeing millions, 
I'm like, why do you need a lock table of 10 million? I'm not really sure. Uh, BI scan time, look it up. It's a new parameter in version 12, which is an interesting parameter that allows the database to reuse empty clusters. So look at that if you're in 12 dot something. And also use BP64 with your pro backups, your DB analysis. Use BP max. It's, it's a good performance parameter to prevent some of these jobs that read the entire database from polluting the entire buffer pool. So look at using minus BP like 64, for example, all right, for doing your backups and your DB analysis. And for the people who have client server especially, um, when you set minus MN and you set minus N, what, set them a little bigger than what you think you need. There's, there's always going to be a time when you need to spawn a new client server broker for some reason. Like it happens often enough that I always round up these numbers quite a bit higher. And they don't affect your license usage, right? The minus N is not related to your license usage. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. So with the um, BI scan parameter, remember to start the BI manager. With the BI scan parameter, remember to start the BI manager. Thank you. Thank you. I don't, I'm, I do, do either of you guys talk about the BI scan time stuff in your talks tomorrow? All right, so we're not covering that in detail in, uh, in, in any talks. All right, some other startup parameters. If you want to do online schema changes, use DB notify time, user notify time, right? You, it, we talk about online schema changes, but the reality is if you don't set these parameters, everybody has to disconnect to read the new schema. So it's not, I mean, it's online, but everybody has to disconnect and reconnect, so it's not really online. So use DB notify time and user notify time. So they changed it from 11.7 to 12.2 for those parameters. So use those if you want to do online schema changes. Use the diagnostic event loggings, especially for lock table overflows. We, we had one today at a customer, and I'm guilty. I, didn't, I have not set that, <coughs> excuse me, diag event. And so we were kind of running after figuring out uh, what was causing the lock table overflow. All right, so I have a to-do item next week when I go back home to enable this diag event at this customer. Um, and if you're doing SQL into your production database, SQL autostats is in version 12. If you're using SQL truncate too large uh, and SQL width update, make sure you use output. And the difference between output and on is that if you say SQL truncate too large on, it will also truncate the field when evaluating the where clause. And I have had customers who've had that problem. So you're saying where city equals Montreal, but the SQL width is four, so it, so it evaluates where city equals M-O-N-T, and of course it doesn't return any records. So use SQL truncate too large output generally here. All right, some startup parameters not to use in your environment here, okay? Don't use direct IO. Don't use minus R and minus I. So minus R and minus I are not go fast parameters. They're smash your database to heck parameters. Now there are times when we use them, uh, when we're trying to do some kind, of, uh, some kind of activity very fast, but the caveat is always if the activity fails, you throw the database away, and you start over again. So if you're doing something where you can afford to throw it away and start over, you might want to use minus R or minus I, but most of the time, and especially not with a production environment, you do not want to use minus R and minus I in your database. Uh, stuff we see around from the old days floating around, sometimes people used to play with the NAP parameters. We see the minus capital G parameter a lot. You don't set those, please. If you have them, just comment them out, you, unless you, Unless you have a very specific reason why you were using them, there's really no reason to use those parameters anymore. Um, again, maybe there's the edge case people who have something very magical about their environment, right? The minus hash parameter is automatically calculated. And this one is my biggest pet peeve because there's a bug in Open Edge Explorer. I'm sure people who've heard me talk have heard me repeat this over and over again. There is a bug in Open Edge Explorer where it could get calculated for you, but then if you change minus B, Open Edge Explorer will not adjust the minus hash for you. Uh, so you really want to make sure that you're not calculating minus hash. And I have great stories to tell about that. And then 
AI stall and BI stall and BI threshold, these are good parameters to use if you actually know what you're doing. And if you have a written, I say written procedure on what to do if you get an AI stall or a BI stall or a BI threshold stall, right? I, I need to know what to do because Simon is going to be on vacation when it happens, right? And then, I don't know, Tom, I won't say Tom, but you know, whoever else is there has no idea what to do. So they just end up crashing the database anyways when they're doing that because they don't know what to do about it, all right? So some features and options as I wrap up here a little bit. Maybe I don't wrap up here a little bit yet. I'm working on it. I, please back up your database. And you know what? I know it sounds funny when I ask you to back up your database, but please check that you backed up your database because I don't know how often I see a, uh, I go to a customer and they think they're backing up their database, but they haven't actually backed up their database. And they tell me, oh, I test the restore every night. Well, that's great. You've been restoring a one-year-old backup every night and the restore is great, but there's a one year of data that's missing from, you know, Tom has the story of, of uh, one of his customers where he, he said set up backup and AI and all of that and the backups had stopped working, but I think all of the scripting had stopped working and so uh, generally speaking, he, he went and found a backup from six months or a year ago, but he had all the AI files. So he, he was, the customer was lucky that he could restore the backup and play six months or a year of AI files forward, but most of you are not that lucky or not going to be that lucky. And, and please, like if I come to your house and you're not running after imaging, like I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, 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 it's, I still see that also every day. I'm like, really? Like, why, why are you not running after imaging? Or we, ha we have a new customer now that we're working with they, they have after imaging, but they only rotate AI files once per day. And you're like, well, you don't have after imaging, <laughs> essentially, right? If your system crashes, you have the backup and that's all you have. So uh, if you're using replication, great product, but don't think that after imaging is a throwaway. You still need to watch out for after imaging. You need those AI files. So still rotate them, archive them. And probably the easiest example of that is if some human accidentally deletes a huge amount of data, how many developers hit F1 in this screen instead of hitting F1 in this screen, right? And then deleted all the whatever records and they thought they were in test, but they were actually in production. So having all these AI files allows you to restore that backup, play forward the AI files, you know, while production is still running, export the data that was accidentally corrupted or deleted and then load it into production, right? So you, you're still perturbing, but there's less of a risk to the business because you deleted that data. And replication will just happily replicate those deletions to the other side. So replication is not going to help you with this. So, so take care of your AI files, all right? Yeah, I know. I'm going to be late. You don't know me. The guy in the back is like, you're almost finished. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, you need one APW. So you need all your helper processes. You need one APW. And if you have more than one APW, I would say that 99% of the time you don't need more than one APW. There are very, very, very few people who need, or databases, I should say, that need more than one APW. So if you go back, home and you're running four APWs because you read a knowledge base entry that said, I don't know what that was written by Gus's grandfather in 1472. It's wrong. You need one. Maybe you need two. I wasn't around. I, I can't prove that you weren't there either. So <laughs> I said 1492. Did I say 19? <laughs> all right. So last section, as I finish, and this is the short section, so it's all right. You, you, once you've configured everything, you need to take care of your environment. You, you need to take care of what you're doing. So stuff happens. It, that's our job, right? So stuff happens. You've got to be ready to, to act when stuff happens, all right? So some things. DB analysis. Please run DB analysis at least once per month. Because one day you're going to show up and you're going to say, why are there 47 million records in the country table? 
You're like, there are not 47 million countries in the world, there never were, why are all these records here? So having that history kind of tells you what happened and then you can correlate that to when some developer put code into production that screwed everything up. Like you have all of that information available to you. So run DB analysis every week, keep it, keep those files. So, so you have that history, right? Um, how fast are you consuming disk space? So if you trend all of this data and you keep all of this history, you can turn to your IT infrastructure people and say, you know what, I'm going to need another 100 gigabytes next year. So don't tell me that the SAN is full. I'm telling you I'm going to need another 100 gigabytes next year for the database. All right. Keep track of those table and index statistics. So we, we said earlier, turn on table range size, index range size, and everything, but keep that information, trend that information. Now, Protop does that for you automatically, but even if you're not using Protop, just take that information, put it in a database, put it in an Excel spreadsheet, I don't care, but save that information so you can understand how your system progresses. And again, it's especially important when you're doing anything major like a code change, you want to know how the code change affected the usage of your database. So keep track of those statistics while you're at it. All right. And little things, well, watch out for database fragmentation, right? Are you fragmenting? Do you need to adjust, create and toss limit in your database? Was there a change in the application maybe at some point that caused fragmentation to begin? Um, do you need to do index compaction? So these deleted key placeholders, so the people who were in Patrice's talk just before, it's a huge thing, uh, especially if you guys do purges in your environments. You've got to do your index compact to clean out those deleted key placeholders when you're doing massive purges in your environments. And you know what? Keep an eye on your log file. Scan your log file so that you can come up, you can see any corruption errors in your database. Make sure when you're doing stuff like backups and restores, when you're doing stuff like DB analysis, you're going to trip over database corruption. So make sure you're doing those things also to see if you're having any corruption in your database. Those will kick them in. I'm not saying you need to run IDX scan and DBRPR every day, but just by doing some of these other things like restoring and DB analysis, you're going to see if there's some corruption in the database potentially. All right. <clears throat> now talking about high availability, just to wrap up, uh, you know, when was the last time you restored a backup? So it's, it's fun to say that you have a, a powerful system and a well configured system, but if something does happen, can you recover from it? And I don't want to go hugely into, you know, DR and business continuity, but you, you're going to build a reliable system. You're going to build a system that can handle the load of production. But if something happens, if someone trips over a cable or if you get flooded and, and the data center is under two meters of water, you need to be able to deal with that. So make sure you have a, a good tested high availability plan in your, in your, in your system. And, and watch out for things like overlapping backup times. People don't realize sometimes that everybody, Oracle and SQL Server and Exchange Server, and everybody wants to take a backup at two o'clock in the morning and the poor SAN can't handle it. So you'll see your performance drop at two o'clock in the morning when everybody's doing backups. So maybe you need to coordinate with other teams in your environment to make sure everyone's doing backups at different times so they're not tripping over each other's feet. And with after imaging, it really doesn't matter when you back up because uh, you're going to be able to roll forward AI files to any point in time anyways. Uh, same thing for rolling forward AIs. Make sure you know how to do it and make sure you have a, a written procedure for rolling forward AI files. Simon? I often see that the backup is overwritten. That the backup server is not backup. Or the backup by a system backup on a wrong moment in time so you don't have the complete program. Ah, so that's a great point that Simon is making. So it's very common for people to back up and overwrite yesterday's backup when they do the backup. Your goal is that whatever you're doing to offload the backup to some permanent storage is doing that so that you have that history. Uh, the point that Simon is making is at one of his customers, they were doing that offline archiving of the backup file while the backup was occurring. So they were actually physically backing up and a corrupted backup file because they were getting half of the new one and half of the old one. All right. And so just to wrap up this talk here in, in terms of uh, DR and business continuity, 
go to your business and find out what are their expectations in terms of recovery point and recovery time. Because a lot of times I, I find that the, when you talk to the IT people and you talk to the business people, there's a disconnect there in expectations, right? Obviously the business wants you to lose zero data and they want you to be down for zero seconds, right? And then you're like, that'll take a hundred million euros, please. And then they're like, well, maybe we can do one minute. And you're like, 90 million euros. Okay, one hour? Ah, now we're starting to be a little more reasonable in terms of, of costs, all right? And, and here's a point here that I wanted to make. If you're in a, if you're in a DR situation, all right, um, and you need to recover on your production box, all right? We have a lot of times we're like, okay, the database is corrupt. Let's go to your DR plan. And the DR plan is, uh, that's the DR plan. And you're like, oh, we have a DR plan, but we can't use it. So if I need to revive a database, I need five to 10 times the size of the database in disk space. Do you have that? Now, I'm not saying you need to take that five or 10 times the disk space and give it to the, the database server and leave it there, but you have to make sure that if you call up the SAN guy or whoever, and you say, I need five terabytes now, because the business is down. You have to make sure that he's able to deliver that five terabytes to you, all right? So, so keep that in mind. And that should be part of your, your SLA with, with, the, with the SAN group, with the IT infrastructure group, that that, infra, that disk space is available to you. And the last thing, of course, I'll finish with is Protop, of course, right? So I think a lot of you have heard of Protop, have seen Protop. Tomorrow at the end of the day, we're doing a commercial session on Protop. Uh, and why you should pay for Protop, the commercial version. And I'll go into some more about Protop then, but you need to have some kind of monitoring in your environment. And, and I'll really delve into the why you need monitoring your environment uh, tomorrow during the commercial session. So, Questions? I'm only six minutes late, come on. <laughs> questions in the chat? Come in. Questions in the room? We're good. Thank you everybody.